where we're staying. We were looking at the, the Okanagan Mountain Park behind us. And then um, Penticton is between the two lakes. And then right now we're at the S, Summerland. Okay, everybody's got their, their bearing. Kelowna is around Okanagan Mountain on the other side. So around the point here and then Vernon all the way up the valley. The main uh, sediments that were deposited in the lake. But the town of Summerland is built on the lake sediments itself. Okay, so that sort of rolling, uh, more, or less, more or less flat surface below us, that's the top of the lake sediments. It's like if you look across the valley, across to the other side where you have the vineyards and the green areas that are irrigated for agriculture, that's the equivalent surface, but on the west side of the valley where we are. So a couple of questions to think about. Um, and also throughout the day, you know, we're telling the story, trying to reconstruct the lake story, but also you guys are thinking about what you have to write, your proposal. So last stop, I asked you, how would you, what do you do with the information like deltas? And Noah said, well, I'd want to map them for sure, but I'd also want their elevation. So two things that if you're thinking of a, a, you know, a methodology, have you explained somebody, you want to convince somebody that you're going to do this project, you're going to have to explain how you're going to do it. Those were good methodological steps that you want to make sure that you capture because somebody's like, well, Good idea, but how are they ever going to do that? Unless you explain it clearly then. Lake sediments across the valley, and in fact, lake sediments in the southern part of the lake basin, quite continuous, all the way across the Penticton, even beyond to Skaha Lake. As we go around the bend in the lake, they tend to thin out and disappear. They're very, very patchy, but then they reappear again around Kelowna, and they continue a bit as we go, as we go north. One of the questions tied to both paleogeography and paleoenvironment is um, the kind of lake that we're dealing with. And if I ask you, like one of the questions is, why do we end up with this configuration of lake sediments? Why are we preserving slivers of lakes, lake bottom sediments on either side of the valley? What could produce that pattern? Uh, not dry enough, but Basically, we trench this, remove the center, leave the sides. Does that make sense? That's, one, that's an option. So the implication would be that the lake sediments would have extended further out and towards the axis of the valley. They don't have to be you know, exact same thickness clear across, but they would have extended further out, and then we've removed some of it. Okay, that's a good option. Do we have another option? And think about the prediction of the deglacial model. What do we expect to have in the valley? That might help us figure that out or understand that. I don't know if that works. Chunk of ice at the bottom of the lake. Yeah. Noah doesn't like that. Why not? Ice floats. <laughs> yes, ice, good point. Ice floats. But ice floats to a point you need to have a fairly, you know, you have to have a, a sort of critical thickness of water relative to its depth. The other thing is, it, is it just ice? There could be ice and sediment mixed in, so the flotation point is not exactly, it's not just an ice cube. This could be a thin layer. Could be a thin layer, yeah. And it's also kind of like buttressed and held in by sediment around it to help stable it. So, right. good point. I mean, how big of a piece of ice is it? That's a good question. And then, um, doesn't it tend to float? Yes, it would, unless somehow we're holding it down with sediment in the ice or against it as well. So those, those are options. What's that? The Okanagan Ice Cube model. Very nice. There you go. Well, remember that this, this, these sediments are lake bottom. So the water surface is above. So I think from what you're saying, so you're thinking of a lake level lower than the benches? Oh, I see, I see, I see. So you're thinking that it's really more like a pattern, like they do this and then they actually sort of end up sort of dipping towards there. But today the lake is obscuring them like that. But in fact, they're more continuous below surface. They're, they're kind of like that. Is that what you're thinking? Like 
Well, that's another good set of questions, which we'll do right after, because we can't really tackle these questions. What I'm getting you guys to do is think of hypotheses, and then we'll think about, okay, what do they predict? Like, what do we expect to see? And you're right on thinking, we kind of have to figure out what's in the middle of the valley, because unless we have that information, we're going to be hard-pressed to make sense of any of these options. Three. Looks pretty wet, sorry? Okay, so to Janina's point, and Kai saying, you know, when you look at them, they're, they're cliffs, they're pretty steep. And if you look at the bedding, which we'll see on the way down and then on the next stop, it's, it dips a bit towards the valley, but it's sub-horizontal. So, you know, if you think of, uh, remember Steno's Law, the principle of original horizontality, you would expect those things to either continue clear across, right, or end abruptly because there's a reason for them to end abruptly, which would be like Noah's Ice Cube. Devin's ice cube. Sorry, he didn't like the ice cube. <laughs> Devin's ice cube. Any other option? Okay, I'll throw one more at you guys. Just a variation on a theme, really. So are we saying these appeared after the lake? Or could they become, become like lateral moraines? So, um... I don't know if we would call them moraines, just in terms of their sedimentology. They don't at all sort of fit the idea of a moraine that, in that sense. But I see where you're going in terms of a lateral deposit, right? So perhaps we're actually depositing, this is, I think, back to the ice cube idea, is that we're actually really focusing sediment in, you know, the depositional basin or the depositional area is actually long and narrow because it's forever, you know, this in plan view looks like here's the valley. Here's the ice cube down the valley, and sedimentation happens on either side of it. That make sense? Yep. So that, the, your lateral idea would sort of look something like that. One option may be, oh, wrong, wrong cap, is that, um, I'll make this even deeper so we can really see the, the pattern. What if we have ice in the bottom of the valley and then we have our lake building on top somewhat and it can extend out in the valley and they don't have to be you know that thick I'm just schematically representing them but there's an extent of the lake sediment and the lake itself over a piece of ice in the bottom of the valley because remember that the deglacial model kind of suggests that there should be chunks of ice stuck in the valley. How do we explain with this model the distribution of lake benches now? Because it, when it melts, it collapses. Okay, so the next stage from that is that the prediction would be we melt the block of ice and we end up with a mess of, we end up with these benches like that but down here in the valley somewhere a mess of collapsed lake sediments that were formerly on top of ice and as the ice melts everything sort of collapses the hydrological systems drain to this valley and deliver sediment to this valley and has has been doing this for a very long time so we might expect to have a valley fill that is in fact very old but also pretty pretty messy pretty complex we'd expect perhaps erosion obviously erosion during glaci glaciation or glacial periods refilling of the valley during glaciation but also in the interglacials we might have rivers on the landscape so we could expect unconformities and multiple packages of and episodes of cutting and refilling and cutting and refilling right? you would expect a valley like that to have potentially some pretty big uh, pretty complex fill the other thing we have to appreciate is just how deep this is. What's the elevation of Okanagan Lake? 342. So if we go down 600 meters to the bedrock surface, how far are we below sea level? Close to 300, 250, 300. Okay, this is a deep valley. We're, in some parts of the valley, we are at sea level or in a few places, a few hundred meters below sea level when you hit the bedrock surface. There's more relief. Just think about what that means. If you're on the bedrock 
the bottom of the valley, like at bedrock, on the bottom of the valley, and you go right to the top of Thompson Plateau. We drove off the edge of the plateau and down to the valley yesterday. That's more relief than the Grand Canyon. But you don't see most of it because there's a lake there and there's something above something. There's sediment. There's a valley fill above the bedrock that brings it close to lake elevation. The lake, lake depth, I think the deepest part is about 150 meters. Okay, so that's a lot of numbers. 340 for the elevation of the current lake. Let's just go with simple whole numbers. 150 as a depth. So we'll call that about 200 meters above sea level. And then a sediment fill that takes us to the bedrock surface of whatever the balance is of plus 200 down to minus 300. So in some places, four or 500 meters thick of sediment filling the valley. There's a lot. There's 87 cubic kilometers of sediment in the valley, in the fill. We're not even talking about the modern lake system. This is all older fill. And then your prediction was, well, since we have such a big valley here, and it's been around for so long, we should expect to have a pretty complex fill that records, you know, all those various climatic episodes of switching in and out of glaciation and eroding and redepositing and cutting and filling and on and on and on, repeating that over millions of years. If we look at the characteristics of the fill, how would we describe it? And there's legends there for the symbology. So have a few minutes, take a, few, a minute or two and look at the, the different units that are identified. And this is identified you know, from seismic, but also drilling. So there is some corroboration of the materials on the geophysics. So how complex is this fill? Let's start there. Not that complicated. Okay. I mean, there's three units. This one lists bedrock as one unit, but we can just ignore that one because we're really interested in the sediment fill. So three major units. Um, well, the three, three B, so four. Four major units. And not that particularly complicated. It goes from poorly stratified cobble gravel on the bottom, and then as you move upward, stratified sand and gravel, and then suddenly laminated sandy silt, and then laminated, laminated silty clay. Really, it's just, it's, it gets finer as you go up. What's not in this legend that you might expect in this area? If you know, like you're thinking about the history of this region, the recent history of this region, and how you might have glaciers in the landscape, what is not in this valley fill that we might expect? Till. There's no till. <laughs> how is that possible? There's no till in this valley fill. 
And if you look around you, there's lots of sediments on the valley, on the edges of the valley where the benches are, but we were just discussing earlier how hard it is to make shorelines in bedrock. If you look at the Okanagan Mound behind you, there's no sediment on that point. But we were covered in ice. What gives? I'm serious. This is a serious question. I'm not... That's kind of odd. So one option is maybe we're... One of these units is completely misinterpreted as till, but we just missed it. But there's some drilling that supports this. And usually if you encounter till, you know it when you're drilling through it because it's very compact and it has a, you know, it's got a characteristic, a, a grain size characteristic that's pretty unmistakable. So how is that, how do we explain that? That is underwater. This is the entire underwater picture. Yeah. Right, but the till would pr presumably be produced throughout glaciation, right? Because the dam and the lake are laid in the story. Remember, it's the last cartoon. Yeah, I know, I'm saying it's gone now. Oh, so we, we wiped it out. Yeah. But then if we wiped it out, did we wipe it out of the whole fill of the valley? None of this is. Yeah, now it's just like incorporated in the lake. Like. So like, uh, what you're saying is that there was till, but it's gone through the... We've reworked it. Yeah. I see, okay. So there was till, but we've reworked it. Okay, that's a, not, that's a good possibility. It is perplexing that, there, you know, there's no real reason, if we know there's erosion, which there is, and we see striations in different places, um, and there's lots of sediment that was produced, clearly, because it's in the fill, there's no reason why we wouldn't expect some till. We'll see some this afternoon. So there's till in this area. It's just not super extensive. So Kai's interpretation is maybe it, there was some. We've just removed it. Or we've, in the process of removing it, we've reworked it into some of this material. Which is interesting. Where's the really old fill that we were predicting that we might expect for something like this? This valley, this deep, this old. Okay, so one option is... We ream it out. We ream it out, we clean it out during glaciation, and then we replace it with a fill that's um, much younger. Like that's, if that's the case, that's an enormous amount of erosion and refilling. Because remember, we're, we have to, re this is not just over in Vernon, this is over the entire length of the valley right through here. Okay, can you turn your blue light on, young oh, man? Yeah. Thank you. All right, so this uh, is known as... So why we're here is because it's a really good place to start on the topic that we're going to get into more during the term, but on quaternary stratigraphy. And this is what we call a type section or a stratotype, meaning that when we try to kind of unravel environmental changes that have happened over a region, we establish reference locations where we think there's a pretty good and continuous record of environmental change over a certain amount of time. Okay, and so this is one of those uh, 
reference sections or stratotype. Page eight has a bit of a DM on it. So we were previously in Kelowna. We came down the tributary of Mission Creek and then we've been driving the highway past the airport, past UBC, all along this, so it's a parallel valley, it's a bit smaller than, and there's no lake in it, so we drive around there. And then we cross over this ridge and then we end up at this area called Okanagan Center. This is called the Okanagan Center Stratotype. And it's on a bench, so there's a bit of an oblique Google Earth image, so you can see, and there's a huge gully. That's what we're looking at there. This, is, this big gully is what's exposed the sediment bench in there. So what we're going to do is, because uh, we have not talked about quaternary stratigraphy at all, and the, the words, some of you will know the words, but the nomenclature varies regionally. And as if there's not enough terminology in stratigraphy, the names you use change. You refer to the same time period, the same units, but they have different names in different regions. So, for example, um, for the Fraser Glaciation, which is the last glaciation we had in this area, the package of sediment associated with glaciation, we will call the Vashon Drift on Vancouver Island and on the coast, but we will call it the Kamloops Lake Drift in the interior. Same representative of the same environmental conditions, glaciation, at the same time, we just regionally give them different names. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of names. We're going to try not to get bogged down on the names. Indirectly, we might, but we don't directly date radiocarbon date the ash. Is it argon argon or potassium argon? So that's one way of dating it um, directly with some of those geochemical methods. But the other way, what we first need to do with ash is you sample it and you analyze it, and you kind of come up with a, a chemical makeup proportions of silicon, oxygen, magnesium, iron, you know, the whole range of common elements you might find in volcanic material. And that chemical makeup is like its fingerprint. And if you have a big list or a big database of multiple fingerprints of different ashes, you can then, first thing you can do is you can recognize it and say, ah, this one comes from this eruption of this volcano. The second thing you're able to do is if enough people have collected ashes, analyzed their chemical makeup, and then dated the material usually above and below the ash that they can identify, either through radiocarbon dating or through some other method, we can start assigning an absolute age to that ash layer. Okay, So this particular ash is an ash that comes from Mount St. Helens. It's So volcanoes in this region, because there are so many and they've been erupting for so long, so um, they, we, we, we call them sets. There's an ash set. There's a series of these different uh, layers produced by different eruptions. So Mount St. Helens. And the set from this particular eruption is called a set C, like the letter C. Okay? The age of Mount St. Helens set C is... 35 to 50,000 years before present. It's a huge range. Part of the reason why it's a huge range is A, we're pushing the limits of radiocarbon dating. There are limits to how, how far you can take radiocarbon dating. 35 to 40,000, maybe 50, depending on the quality of the samples. So we're really like stretching the method in terms of how much we can resolve from deposits. So this date comes mostly from a group of people in Oregon, I think, that have cored a lake in the Cascades. And in the core, they've extracted a, a series. They find three or four different ashes from different volcanoes. They sample each one. They send to the lab. They do the chemical fingerprint. They go to the database. They say, oh, yeah, this one is Mount Mazama. This one is, uh, I don't know, uh, Rainier or something. And this one is St. Helens. And it's set C based on the chemical makeup. In their core, they've got organic material. They date what's immediately above the ash in the core, immediately below, that brackets the age of the ash. Does that make sense? So we're not dating the ash per se, radiometrically, but we're dating sediment or material, organic material above and below it. So 35 to 50,000 for Mount St. Helens. And the neat thing is if we could have gone down there is you can actually dig it out and you can actually like physically touch the ash. It's a really uh, unique texture to ash. It's kind of gritty and but fine at the same time. Um, and that's a, a really old, St. Helens tephra, or ash. There's another one 
And that other ash is in here, in the capping sand, you know, the, some of the youngest material that's on this whole section. Um, and that one is from Mount Mazama. Mount Mazama is the name, you, yeah, it's Crater Lake, exactly. But you know the age of the Crater Lake eruption? <laughs> on Tuesday? Eight point two, roughly eight thousand years ago, give or take. It changes. The age gets refined because that's a fairly common one that we found in in Washington and in the Cascades and Northwest and in BC as well. So we got absolute ages on the upper unit and on one of these this units. And you know we have a paleosol. We infer it to be from an interglacial period. And thirty-five thousand to fifty thousand actually works with that interval. We're in the interglacial at that time. So, um, there are other methods you can use to try to date materials beyond radiocarbon and using ash that you associate with known eruptions where you know the age. And this, there's a whole method called optical dating or optically stimulated luminescence, luminescence dating. And we use some of this, these methods to date some of these different units. So that method, you know, if I try to summarize it briefly, the method is, works this way. You sample sand grains, and the idea with these sampled sand grains is that when sand grains are exposed to sunlight, the sunlight, the photons basically excite the crystal, and they release from the crystal structure what we call alpha and you know, gamma and beta particles that the sediment acquire through just the, the ongoing radioactive decay of material. So you need to think of sunlight or exposure to light as a way of zeroing the amount of particles that are in the grain. If you take that grain again and you bury it where it's shielded from radiation, like solar radiation and sunlight, it acquires, it builds up, think of it as like a little reservoir of these particles that come from the ambient decay of material. So if I buried this, you know, sand grains, that's part of a package of sand in this section, and they don't see sunlight for a long time, they're acquiring these particles, just being stationary in the deposit, okay? And what we do with luminescence dating is we come and sample that buried material. You do it carefully, and it usually involves like a piece of aluminum, like irrigation pipe. It's about a foot or two feet in length. And you insert it into a, a face, and then you excavate it. So what you want to do is capture or trap in the pipe, not the sediment that was right on the, out, on the face of the outcrop or the exposure, because that's exposed to light. What we want is sediment some distance in the face where it doesn't, hasn't seen light since it's been buried. And we're going to cap the, the tube, and you take that sealed tube so that the center section basically hasn't seen light. Even though you sampled it, there's no light that's affected it. Take that to the lab, and in a special room where there's no, or you control the, the, the light that's in there, you take that sand out of the tube, and you are going to uh, artificially excite the sand grains to release whatever they've accu accumulated when they were buried. But you're going to measure it when you do it. You're going to measure what they release. And if you can have an idea of the ambient radiation in this area, and you know how much has been accumulated, you can work back from the rate of ambient radiation, you can work back a time since that sand grain last saw sunlight. So you're basically more or less indirectly uh, measuring time of burial and the last time it was exposed to sunlight. Does that make sense, that sequence? Yeah, yeah, it's a very cool thing. It's super interesting. You can do this with quartz grains, you can do it with feldspar grains mostly. They actually behave differently, they acquire material differently, so you kind of get different uh, values or different ages from different grains, and the specialists that do that know how to sort of interpret those slight variations. Um, but you can see there in the table, that those are the samples that have been collected uh, you can see some of them are quartz, some of them are feldspar. There's an amount on the dose rate. The dose rate is the ambient radiation. And based on that dose rate and the quantity that's released, you come up with an optical age. Okay, so what you see from different samples in different places is that some of the oldest material where we took the samples, OCS2, 113,000 years old. 
So maybe what we should do is recap a little bit of yesterday. Maybe that just sort of put the picture back together because we, we made a lot of stops yesterday late into the day and we, we talked a lot about a different, different aspects of what's in the valley in different locations. So sometimes connecting them is, gets tricky. Um, we, can't, we started the day thinking about what kind of lake Lake Penticton was in terms of its you know, paleo environment and its paleo geography. That was our, our big goal because your project is tied to that. What do you mean? By what I mean okay, so when we talk about what type of lake, you know, we talked about proglacial lakes, superglacial lakes. We talked about ice marginal lakes. We thought, talked about just a regular lake with no ice in the valley and that kind of thing. That's what I was referring to. What do we think of the the option of having the lake? So everything was kind of tr the whole discussion was triggered by the current distribution of lake bottom benches or sediments, right? So these slivers along the valley, and we—I don't know if you've been looking, but those lake benches continue all the way to Penticton and south of Penticton along Skaha Lake. That configuration is the same; continues all the way uh, just about to Okanagan, Okanagan Falls. How did we feel about the idea that these are uh, these ribbon lakes where there's water really in a long, narrow sliver on either side of a big piece of ice in the valley? Does that work? You're, you're talking about the lack of plates. Right, so we were trying to reconcile this problem or this observation more than a problem, but what happens to the clays? And what is the sort of distal part of these really thick and energetic, you know, turbidites that we were looking at yesterday as we climbed up the bluff? Really meters of silt and fine sand deposited repeatedly over and over to create these really thick benches of lake sediments. And we say, well, we'd expect clays in the basin, but where, where does it go? And the easy answer was, well, it went that away. You know, like it went to the axis of the valley somewhere, but then that has implications for what we imagine to be in the axis of the valley in the first place, whether we have a great big chunk of ice and two lakes on either side. So I think we kind of did away with that option just based on the, the prediction of where clays might end up and where we would see them. And if there is, in fact, ice blocking these basins, the clay should be closer to where these coarse, deposit, coarse and thick deposits are. Relatively coarse, right? Coarse for a lake bottom. What does that leave us with? It leaves us with ice in the valley, but not sort of constraining two ice lateral lakes. Raise with me, right? So we could have a, a lake that's effectively supraglacial, so on top of some ice in the valley. And then how would then we then how would we then interpret or explain the distribution of lake sediments? Those slivers. Why do we, they look the way they do today? Right, it would collapse, right? The, the expectation is we would have had lake bottom sediments extending towards the axis of the valley, but a portion of the axis of the valley is occupied by ice, and then when that ice melts, whatever is deposited on top of the ice ends up kind of collapsing, and it produces this appearance today of this, these missing, you know, sort of central portion of sediments. And yes, they could have, and when we look at those lake sediment beds that we climbed up yesterday, you would expect them to thin as they go towards the axis of the valley. So they don't have to be clear, the same thickness, right clear across the valley. They could just be sort of la pinching out in thickness, but also dipping towards the center of the, the valley. It doesn't really radically change that. If we had that on top of ice and we collapse it, then we wouldn't see them today. The next question we had for ourselves was, um, what happens, or how much ice is potentially in the valley? on which we deposit this lake. So this superglacial lake on top of a piece of ice, how thick is this ice? And then we, we had some more difficulties and I didn't actually bring all the seismic lines to hash that out fully, but we said we'd expect deformation in the valley fill if there's a significant thickness as the you know, existing the, uh, model of deglaciation would, would suggest that these valleys like Okanagan, and we know how deep it is, would have been these major trunk valleys with trunk glaciers, you know, big glaciers down the the axis of the valley, we could be talking about hundreds of meters of ice that fill the valley. We'd expect the valley fill to reflect that, the presence of that ice through some collapse. And it's not entirely clear on the seismic data that exists, but uh, it also doesn't jump out at you that everything is collapsed. So maybe a bit of an open question for that. Um, 
we were also thinking about lake reconstruction and uh, we thought this is really very much about the geography and also the paleo environment together where it's constraining where the lake exists but also in what configuration and what kind of environments so in that broad category of environment we're putting the, the lake type in there we start our day yesterday thinking about deltas as a way of constraining the elevation of a water surface and shorelines as another set of data that, that if you can identify and measure in terms of elevation at least helps you constrain the water surface because we associate those fairly confidently with a, a stable water surface you know you need a stable water surface to have waves that carve notches in the hillside but we said we don't see many probably because the hillsides are made of pretty hard rocks but we did see some yesterday north of Kelowna on the hillside there was a couple of very very linear and continuous um, sets of well shorelines on the on the hillside so let's just go back to the Lake Thompson story a bit to sort of patch those things together because when I when we came here instead of going to that area we said that's all right because there's a lot of similarities between the two basins there's a few differences but there's some similar situ uh, situations in the Lake Thompson basin we all and so that includes this valley here this east-west valley Kamloops Ashcroft area we have very similar uh, configuration of the lake bottom sediments so kind of a missing strip down the axis of the valley and then benches on either side and Kamloops that's the case in this valley here that's the case as well but in this valley there's the, the valley's a bit narrower than Okanagan but also there's a river that actively flows through there today and so there's clear terracing of some of the lake bottom sediments in the Thompson we see that or we see evidence much like here there is in fact some ice present in the valley in the lake sediments because we have kettles we have areas where we can see depressions and so you had ice blocks that melted much like the tributaries around Okanagan Lake but there's a big difference between isolated ice blocks in a basin and you know an enormous trunk valley that occupies the valley axis and then we have sediment on top so it's about thinking about you know the significance of the, the, the volume of ice that might realistically be in the valley and differentiating between individual more or less isolated blocks of ice versus you know a valley length tongue of ice that's still stuck in the valley bottom and decaying so in the Thompson com combination of um, combination of shorelines and deltas there are better shorelines in the Thompson there's more sediment on the hillsides allows you to reconstruct water planes and in the case of the Thompson so there's the valley so this is Ashcroft this is going to Kamloops this is down to Spencer's Bridge so it's in that right angle east-west going down to the south in that valley we can identify basically two sets of stable water surfaces there are two sets of shorelines and there are two sets of deltas that we can correlate across the basin and that allows us to reconstruct two different water planes that are stable at different times it is a type you could think of it as a bit of a, a type of take them it's isostatic rebound okay so that's the one thing that we have not talked about this whole time uh, but what we're seeing in the you know the this is sort of a statistical best fit like what's the the best line of fit that allows you to um, connect these points and then you end up with the slope that's created but that slope is effectively a measure potentially of the amount of rebound that happens in the basin so the features the shorelines the deltas across the basin that we correlate are in fact and were in fact connected by a, a horizontal surface the water surface of the lake but since deglaciation the landscape has rebounded isostatically so that if you go and measure them today the surf the surfaces and the features that were once at the same elevation tied to that horizontal water plane are now appearing to be at different elevations across the basin does that make sense like we're thinking about so this is a post glacial rebound of the landscape which then kind of offsets the elevation of different features that are in fact correlative in time to the same water plane but that no longer appear at the same elevation because the landscape has rebounded. Yeah, we're good on that. Conceptually on what that looks like. Um, in the Thompson, the reconstruction of isostatic rebound is probably feasible and better than in the Okanagan. And in the Okanagan, um, there's no clear isostatic rebound pattern. And that doesn't mean that there was no isostatic rebound. It just means that we haven't yet been able to sort of sort out what it looks like in the Thompson if we look at these um, 
these graphs, if we take these graphs, remember that this is really the rebound of a plane. It's a planar surface, not just lines. You know, the, the shorelines, although they're line features on the landscape, they, they define a plane, which is the water plane of the lake. And the rebound is a, the rebound of that plane. So we're not just saying, oh, this line goes up and down like that. We're saying the line appears to go up and down because a plane is shifting its position and its orientation, right? So to get the, ma the most out of a reconstruction of a planar surface like that, it's very useful to have sort of two axes of that plane potentially preserved. So in the Thompson, uh, that reconstruction probably works much better than in the Okanagan because in the Okanagan, we really have a straight kind of north-south lake basin, whereas in the Thompson, we have an east-west connecting to a north-south lake basin. And so if we can link up features that we associate with the water plane along that right angle or along the north-south and the east-west direction, then we're, we're maybe better able to constrain uh, the rebound on the plane. If you do that in the Okanagan, and you imagine the, the rebound is in the same direction as what's in the Thompson, but you're only measuring it along a north-south trend, it's very hard to get some good measurements or reliable measurements that allow you to define that plane. Like defining a whole plane with a single line along one axis of the plane is really tricky. You can imagine, right? But it, doing it with the right angle becomes much more reasonable, right? Much more reliable. But you might remember from yesterday that, um, you know, this diagram where we're using deltas at, in this elevation envelope and it's sort of 500 to 525, there's quite a bit of range there. Maybe within that range, we're seeing the effects of isostatic rebound. So maybe we're seeing features that are 25 meters higher in some parts of the basin and than in the other. And then maybe that's the, um, the effects of isostatic rebound, but we're not really able at this point anyways, uh, to sort out what the, the, basically what the equation of the slope on that planar surface would look like. That's what it comes down to, but defining exactly what the plane would be. And when we define this plane, we'd have to, we'd be, if we could, or when you look in the Thompson, what you end up defining is the direction of maximal rebound, right? And then the total amount of rebound that happens. So it's not just how much elevation change is there within the lake basin on that planar surface, but also in what direction is the, is the rebound happening. And in this case, the rebound in the Thompson seems to be happening mostly in a sort of a northwest direction. So that's where you have the most amount of... So if you want to picture it this way, the rebound of this surface is sort of like this, right? So to the northwest of the basin, which works in this case quite well to constrain it because it's um, on the east and on the north-south component, we can define it. So in the Okanagan, kind of a, remains an open question. There's no real reason to expect no rebound, but... Uh, not clear exactly on the pattern, the direction, and the amount of total rebound in the valley. What we do know, though, from the Thompson is that the rates or the amount of rebound are really high. So the landscape responds uh, fairly strongly, or there's a substantial amount of rebound that happens in these valleys. So that speaks more to the behavior of the uh, stenosphere and the mantle and the crust in the, in the Cordillera, and how well it rebounds after being loaded by by ice. There's something else in this, in the Cordillera that makes rebound tricky. What would that be? Or the patterns we might expect in terms of rebound. And remember that rebound reflects loading of the crust, right? Loading of the land surface and we load it mostly with ice. I guess in the valleys it's going to be more loaded than the Right. In the valleys, you know, if this model of having really thick ice in the valleys and thinner ice on the summits is, is right, then we have enormous loads along the valleys and correspondingly or um, comparatively smaller loads in the summits just because of that really huge difference in ice thickness that we said is kind of part of the characteristics of the Cordillera and ice sheet, just given the topography. And we also have lots of faults. And it's entirely possible that we have, we accommodate some rebound along faults as well. It's not just a straight rebound of the, of the, the land. Maybe we accommodate movement along faults and there's a bit of reactivation of faults. So a lot of things that can kind of obscure the pattern and make it trickier to, to decipher. And when I say that, trickier to decipher, I'm really saying trickier than if you were doing the same thing in the Laurentide ice sheet, which is where most of the, the patterns of rebound have been established. In fact, in the Laurentide, uh, 
the bedrock is much more uniform in terms of its composition, but also the ice load is much more gradual. Remember the fact that there's little topography means that at the spreading centers, the ice is really thick. As you move towards the margin, it gets thinner and thinner. And so the pattern, the rebound is much more consistent across different parts of the Laurentide, just because the thickness of ice was much more consistent across the landscape. We're not dealing with all this topography. Does that, does that make sense?